following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. In other words, is what is faith? Is faith believing in something even though you know in your heart it can't be true? Is <laughs> yeah. that what faith is? Right. Right. And I say, no, faith is taking a step of trust in the same direction that the evidence is pointing. The evidence of science, the evidence of history, the arguments of philosophy point in the direction of God. Best-selling author Lee Strobel offers a rational exploration of proof for God's existence next on Life Today. Welcome to Life Today. I'm Randy Robinson. Tammy Trent is with me, and we're hey. excited to have you here because we're going to equip you in your faith today. And, you know, Tammy, it's I'm on social media. I handle some of the social media stuff for Life Today, and you always get people that are like, God's not real. I, and yeah. I'm like, how, how, do you, how do you know? I, I mean, know. And, and they'll ask us, how do we know? Do you, do you get a lot of the proving God kind of stuff? Yes, for sure. I think especially with what I've walked through in life, my own grief and sorrow, mm. and people have often said, how do you keep trusting in a God that I don't think exists? Mm. So tell me, why do you believe? And I, wow. I think it's incredibly important for us and for me as a Christ follower to know, why do I believe yeah. that God is real? Yeah. And let me dig into it. And if I'm not even sure how to dig into it, find somebody that does and has done the research mm -hmm. and then pick up that book and start learning. Yeah. I think that's what I've done too, as we've kind of researched a little bit on Lee yeah. Strobel. Oh, like, yeah. well, he's amazing. Yeah, very good. Yeah. And in fact, he's, he's going to help equip you today mm -hmm. to deal with a culture that increasingly doesn't believe God is real. Mm -hmm. And the title of his latest book is just that, Is God Real? Lee, it's so great to have you back on Life Today. Oh, I appreciate that. You're always great to be here. Thank you. So, I mean, do, do Christians in your experience have difficulty answering that very basic question? Prove God to me, right? Yeah, and we have more and more Americans who are doubtful that God is real. Mm -hmm. You know, back when I was in high school and met my wife in 1966, 98% <laughs> uh, of American adults believed in God. You know what the number is now? 81%, lowest in history. Mm -hmm. And a lot of skepticism, not just among young people, but old people as well, mm -hmm. uh, are really? skeptical about only about half of people born between before 1946 believe that God is real. So it is a big question. And we all have friends who are outside the faith, who are curious or are doubters. And I think we have to be prepared as the Bible tells us to be, mm -hmm. to give an answer to those who ask us for the reason for the hope that we have. Why are so many leaving the faith? Why do so many not believe? You know, I think it's a complex question. I think we've, um, you know, we've gone through a lot of trauma in our world over the last 50 years, wars, scandals, social upheaval, mm -hmm. uh, viruses and so forth. Um, we see things like that. We see people through who are influenced greatly by social media, yes. uh, who are influenced by the internet. There is so much misinformation mm -hmm. coming through the internet yes. about, you know, false claims about the Bible, false claims about Jesus and so forth, that I think a lot of people are confused. What do you, when you look at the questions that, that people are asking, yeah. are there any that sort of repeat themselves, any common questions when it comes to just the basic existence of God? Yeah, they, they want to know, uh, can I have confidence that it's true? Mm -hmm. In other words, is what is faith? Is faith believing in something even though you know in your heart it can't be true? <laughs> yeah. Is that what faith <laughs> right. is? Mm -hmm. right. And I say, no, faith is taking a step of trust in the same direction that the evidence is pointing. Mm -hmm. The evidence of science, the evidence of history, the arguments of philosophy point in the direction of God. And then we take a step in that same direction, which is logical and rational and put our trust in Jesus. Uh, so faith is taking a step in the same direction that the evidence is pointing. You're suggesting that God is not contrary to logic, right. reason, 
science and even. Right. But that is sort of the, the popular notion yes. out there is that, well, you either believe in God or you believe in science and logic and reason. Mm. And this is so ironic because over the last 50 years, there have been a series of scientific discoveries in three areas in particular, and I deal with these areas in the book. One is the origin of the universe called, called cosmology. Where did the universe come from? Number two, the fine-tuning of the universe, the fact that the numbers that govern the operation of the universe are finely tuned on a razor edge so that life can exist mm -hmm. in a way that defies the idea of it could be mere chance. And then the information, biochemistry, the information inside every cell in your body. Do you know you have 100 trillion cells in your body? If you were to open up any one of them and take out the DNA and uncoil it, it would be six feet tall. Wow. And embedded in that DNA mm. is a four-letter chemical alphabet that spells out the precise assembly instructions for every protein out of which you're made. There are more words, more information in every cell in your body than you would find in 200 years of the Sunday New York Times. Where does information come from? You know, uh, nature can yeah. produce patterns. If you walk down the beach and in the wet sand, you see ripple marks, you can say, oh, the waves left those patterns in the sand. But if you walk down the beach and you see John loves Mary and a heart around it and an arrow through it, you wouldn't say, oh, the waves created that. <laughs> right, That's right. right. Because there's always an intelligence behind information. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that away? So I think science, in just the last 50 years, we have more evidence for the existence of a supernatural creator than ever before. I, when you look at stuff like that, the DNA and the, yeah. and the, the complexity, even the, the eyeball, yeah, right. I've, yeah. I've, I've had a lot of eye issues, so right. I've gotten very. And you just go, that that doesn't just, yeah, just randomly exist. Right. right? There's there seems to be purpose. So I think yes. when you get to the point of discussing purpose and in, in design, yes. if you will, yes, how do you then connect that to the God that? we believe in, yeah. as opposed to it's just, a great question. right, aliens uh, or something. I'll, I'll give you an example, <laughs> cosmology, yeah. the origin of the universe. Yeah. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. We now know the universe began to exist at some point in the mm -hmm. past. Therefore, there must be a cause behind the universe. Okay, but what kind of a cause could bring a universe into existence? Well, it must be transcendent, that is separate from creation. It must be immaterial or spirit because it existed before the physical world. Mm -hmm. Must be eternal or timeless because it existed before physical time was created. Mm -hmm. Must be powerful given the immensity of the creation event. Must be brilliant, intelligent given the precision of the creation event. Must be, And you just go down the list and you look and you say, this is a description of God. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of um, um, creator that could bring a universe into existence matches the description of the God of the Bible. So that's kind of how you make that leap. And it's not a, a, a leap away from faith. It's a leap in the same direction the evidence is pointing. Mm -hmm. Wow, have you always been this passionate? <laughs> have you always been this passionate about like the study of the existence of God? Like, have you ever doubted yourself? Lee, it's hard for me yeah. to imagine you have, but like, how did you even get to this place yeah. in your life? I was an atheist for much of my life. And mm. so um, um, I, I doubted it, not because I'd researched it thoroughly and come to a conclusion that didn't make sense. I just thought, I'm too smart for this. Really? You know, I, I just thought um, the mere concept of an all-loving, all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe, come on, it's crazy. Right. It wasn't worth my time to check out. So I was an Adam and atheist, and then my wife became a Christian. She was an agnostic. She became a Christian. And I thought, how can I rescue her from this cult that she's gotten <laughs> yeah. involved in? Right. And I thought, I'll just disprove the resurrection of Jesus. I'll disprove the existence of God. And I spent two years of my life using my legal background and my journalism background to investigate the evidence until November the 8th of 1981, when I sat down, I realized, wait a minute, it would take more faith to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian based on all the evidence I've encountered that tells me that Christianity is based on truth. I have a question about that. You used yeah. a couple of terms, atheist, agnostic. Yeah. Uh, a atheists say there is no God. Right. Agnostic says we don't really know. Yeah. And I, when I'm talking to someone, someone who comes at me, and I find, you find a lot of people that say they're atheists are really agnostic. Most of them are. Most of them, correct. right? Yes. But the ones that come at me with, with the I know mm. there is no God, yeah. as opposed to the I, I just can't get all my questions answered. Yeah. And I think maybe it's not the God you're talking about. 
I have a hard time engaging in, in productive conversation mm. with someone who is hardcore atheist because yeah. they're closed minded. Yeah. They tend As to opposed be. to the agnostic. Yeah. Is this is this am, am I onto something? I'll talk to agnostics yeah. all day long. Yeah. But I have a hard time sometimes when you think about it, to be a true atheist, you would have to be God. <laughs> Ironically. Wow. Because mm. how could you know beyond any doubt that God right. doesn't exist. You would right. have to know all. Right. Well, knowing all, that's a quality of God. So what often happens is a person who calls himself an atheist will often just ratchet up their resistance to unreasonably high levels. Mm -hmm. So there was a woman who was an atheist. She wrote an article for Skeptic Magazine. And she said, what would it take for me to believe that there's a God that does miracles? Well, if a chicken learned how to read and then beat a grandmaster at chess, then maybe I'd start to think that there was a miracle that had taken place, but it would take, and you go, really? I mean, that's just, that's just ratcheting the resistance to an unreasonable level. Uh, I think the question of does God exist is a evidential question. Mm -hmm. And you can look at the evidence of science, the evidence of history, you can look at the arguments of philosophy, and you can reach a verdict and conclude, do I believe it is true or it's not true? I believe the most rational decision is that God exists and he is the God of Christianity. Jesus is his only son. Um, mm. I spent years now investigating this stuff. But if you ask most people how much have you looked into it, they really haven't. Mm. I interviewed Hugh Hefner, the great hedonist and founder mm. of Playboy magazine once. Yeah. And, and um, we were talking about faith issues. And I said, um, what about the resurrection of Jesus? And he said, oh, if the resurrection's true, that changes everything. Yeah. I mean, that <laughs> knocks over a series of dominoes. That means there's an afterlife. And oh my goodness, wow. that, have you investigated? Have you? No, no, never mm. really looked into mm. it. Well, I have. <laughs> I spent two years doing it. And guess what? The historical data is powerful and conclusive and compelling that wow. Jesus didn't just claim to be the Son of God. He backed up that claim by returning from the dead. And so I think you find a lot of people who want themselves, they want to be God. Mm -hmm. Or they want, they'll only yeah. come to God on their terms. Right. If God agrees to so this, 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 and this, maybe I'll believe in him. Um, well, they want to rule their own universe. They yeah. don't want to be told what to, they don't want to be held accountable yeah. by God. Mm -hmm. And so they'll ratchet up the skepticism to unreasonably high levels. One thing I say to people like that is this. Let me just ask you a question. If God did exist and you could ask him only one question and you knew he'd give you an answer right now, mm. what would you ask him? Okay. And the reason I ask that question is it kind of distills down what's That's their good. biggest sticking point uh, between yes. them and God. Yes. You know, yeah. we all have sticking points holding us up in our journey toward yeah. God. And if you can define what that is, then I can mm. help you find answers. Mm. Wow. So That's in 80% of the cases, if you ask a non-believer that question, they're going to say some permutation of why does a loving God allow suffering? Mm. That's a big one. Yes. That's a big one. Definitely. And so... Um, great, now we can discuss it. Mm -hmm. And if I can give you an answer to satisfy your heart and soul, maybe you get past that sticking point and make progress toward God. Yeah, uh, we'll, 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 we'll get into that okay. on the suffering. Uh, I do want to ask you, though, about the, the, the scriptures that even talk about looking at, at the world, looking at creation. Yeah. Yeah. I was snow skiing several years ago on a Sunday morning guilty. Yeah. <laughs> you went to Salem and I church on here. <laughs> <laughs> no, not that weekend. And, and someone texted me, hey, are you, are you at church? Uh, and I was standing on the top of mm. in Keystone, Colorado, not in you, like, you yeah. know, the area. And you can see the, the, oh. the continental divide for, oh. I mean, miles and miles and miles. Snow capped, gorgeous, beautiful day, blue sky. Mm. And I texted back and I said, uh, I'm, I'm not at church, but I'm at, I'm at God's cathedral. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. True. Yeah. And I was being a little snarky, but I thought about it's that true, later, yeah. and I went, mm. honestly, I sense God's presence yeah. up here because mm. the, the creation is just so overwhelming and beautiful. And there's a lot yes. of places on earth like that, but how much does creation speak to the Creator? It does. You know, the Old Testament says that the heavens pour forth the evidence of God, mm -hmm. the speech mm -hmm. of God, you know, the, and, and in Romans 1 verse 20, it talks about how just observing nature, we can discern that there is a God. We can look at his divine characteristics based on, and it says, in fact, it's so clear that we're without excuse. Yeah. Yes. Now, what's interesting yes. is the Greek there says that we tend to suppress that. 
And the imagery in the Greek is this, that the awareness of God kind of raises up in our minds and we see this evidence, but then like a pedal, we push it down. Mm. And then it begins to come up again and like a pedal, we push it back down. Wow. That's the imagery in the Greek. We're, we're suppressing it. We're, and that's what happens because we don't want to be held accountable. We want to rule our own life. We want to come to God in our own terms yeah. and so forth. And so we suppress the evidence we see. But you're absolutely right. I know a famous philosopher, Christian philosopher, who came out of skepticism and out of atheism because of being in the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> and he, he wow. experienced the power of God's creation and it pointed him toward the God of the Bible, changed his life. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think you experienced some of that in Angola with the stars. Yes. Did you see that? Definitely. I'm, I'm in Angola on a trip with Life Outreach, and, and I remember uh, being on a cot, and it was dark as dark, oh, yeah. and, and just sitting there looking up. And, and you can't help in those moments, Lee. Like, for me, always, Randy, that's a time to where I'm, I just, I feel one, the presence of God, but it's that awe moment of you who made the moon, you who made the stars. Yeah. I cannot express the sum of who you are. Yeah. And just recently I was kayaking outside of Nashville and went to a waterfall, Burgess Fall. And the same thing when I come to this waterfall and going like, I, my eyes are always fixed on Look at what you yeah. did. Yeah. How could there not be a God? Like yeah. I'm, mm. I'm not constantly trying to prove him wrong. I'm looking at the proof all around me constantly. Yeah. And now, that's excitement of life for me. Here's an interesting exercise. When you're, when you're in a place like that and you're looking up at the stars at night, imagine instead of seeing stars, you see a hundred giant dials in the sky. Dials that could be set at one of trillions of settings, a hundred of them in the sky, and they're all exactly calibrated oh, so that life wow. can exist. Mm. That is the picture wow. that modern physics gives us of our universe. Wow. Um, our, the numbers that govern our world are so incredibly mind-blowingly, intricately and intertwined, but intricately set beyond what could possibly be happen by chance, that it points toward the existence of God. Wow. Let, let me ask you something real quick. We're, we're short, yeah. we're running out of time. I'll have to have you come back for another program. But we, we have this, I, I, and a lot of us my age especially, have this idea of the science over here, the God yeah. idea over here. Yeah. I, I have found, and correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. that anytime someone wants to talk physics or astronomy or chemistry or any of these scientific fields, yeah. I, I almost want to encourage them, keep digging. Yes. Because mm -hmm. I do think that science does Absolutely. point back to God. And, and, and even more so, as I say, in the last 50 years. Yeah. These discoveries involving the fine tuning of the universe really came about in the last 50 years. Mm. The information in DNA, we didn't know about that 50 years ago to the degree that we know today. So these are new things that are happening and if people open their eyes, uh, one of my friends is one of the most famous scientists in the world and he's a professor at Rice University, James Tour. And um, he said this, he said, only a rookie who knows nothing about science <laughs> would say that science points away from God. <laughs> science, when it's done right, points toward mm. a supernatural creator. Yeah. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. You need to dig a little, dig a little more and be willing to be willing to go where the evidence points. Right, right. Uh, and that's good. Mm. We don't need to fear science. Yeah. And we well, don't need exactly. to try to fight against it or disprove. Just let, let the science point to God yes. and you will find out. God's real, yes. and he's shouting from the heavens so that we can know him. We're going to talk about a big issue in another program with Lee, and that's the issue of suffering, mm. because that's a very real sticking point, even for many of us who believe in God. We go, is God good? There's suffering. I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Well, we want to show you something today that is a picture of suffering and ask you to join us in representing God to these people. Mm -hmm. Watch this and we'll show you how. Oh, hello. Thank you for letting me come to your house. Hello, Mama. As I told you earlier, our friends at the medical clinic shared a little of your story with us. And so we wanted to come and pay our respect and our condolences. Can you tell me your baby that you lost? What was, what was the baby's name? As I've sat here today and listened to Christina's story, it's the story of so many mothers here in Angola and so many of the other countries that we work here in Africa. 
Valentin was, was sick and you took him to the hospital. What did the doctors tell you? There's so many things, whether it be drought, whether it be floods, so many variables that affect their lives that are so fragile already that just one little change can bring destruction. One little change can bring death. Do you think about Valentin often? What was he like? I know it's hard, I'm sorry. It's okay. When I asked Christina about Valentin, she can't hardly talk about it. And she's able to talk about this brand new baby. And boy, when I asked about her daughter that is still alive, she, she brightened up and she wanted to talk. But the fact is a mother's heart cries out for the one that is lost. What do you believe would help your village? How does that make your heart feel? She said, many people talk about the solutions, but they never come. And the reality is we do have the solution. We have the solution with Mission Feeding because Mission Feeding provides food for children in school high protein, high caloric diet that will give them everything they need to learn so that there is a future and a hope for them. So I'm asking you, would you please help us with Mission Feeding? We can together put a hot meal in every Mission Feeding bowl every day for a child's life. Precious, precious little babies. When I watch uh, a piece like that, the initial feeling I get is that uh, we could have done something to save Valentine's life. We could have. It took so much for her to get to that clinic. I've been there on the ground. I know what it's like. I know what it takes. I know how hard it is to walk miles and miles and miles to get to a clinic that when you move forward in that piece and you see some of those other children that are actually thriving, that are eating out of that bowl, that have been given something of great value and need to their little bodies to keep them alive. We could have done something. I could have done something to help save that little guy's life. So I think today when we come to you with this need, it's real, it's genuine, and it's urgent right now, Randy. We are feeding 350,000 children every single day, but there's one more. There's one more out there right now that needs us. And I think that's why it's so urgent that we come together and it's really completely doable to me. It is, and you know, we've been doing this for many years. In fact, 350,000 children a day, that, that's a yeah. real, no, that's actually the low end. <laughs> that's the verifiable. Because we have so many people on the ground right now who have given their lives to helping others. Uh, and, and it's very fluid at times. There are some places where we have been feeding for a longer period of time, but the needs change, the needs move. And that's, that's one reason it's so hard for, sometimes for a mother to get her child to, uh, to get some help quick enough uh, because they can be remote and because hunger sets in oftentimes very fast and then disease on the back of it. With the mission feeding program, however, we are able to supply desperate areas with this emergency food relief. We're able to fill that bowl. And it's very simple. It's very cost effective because we've been doing this for so many years. In fact, $30 will help feed three children for three entire months. I mean, that, that's not a fancy meal. That's very basic, but that's what they need to sustain them until they can get back on their feet again. Your gift of $50 today would do that for five children. $100 will help feed 10 children for the next three months, and some of you can easily give $1,000 to help feed 100 children. Whatever you can do, we're asking you to come alongside of us so, like Tammy said, we can reach that one more. Yeah. That one who today is maybe hungry, but tomorrow we be facing death. Mm -hmm. We want to intervene. We can only do it with your support. 
I'm asking you to go to the phone or go online and make the best gift you can. Across the continent of Africa, children are suffering, facing severe malnutrition and even death. With food reserves gone and many areas experiencing severe famine, we urgently need to replenish supplies to keep feeding the 350,000 children who are counting on us. Through Life's Mission Feeding Outreach, your gift of love can be an answer to prayer for a hurting and hungry child in their time of need. Call now with your life-saving gift of $30, $50, or $100 to help feed and care for three, five, or ten children for three full months. With your gift of any amount, we'll send you the brand new Life Planner. Bound in soft touch leather, this planner will help you with your daily walk with space for you to record your appointments, goals, inspirational notes, and prayers. With your gift of $100 or more, please request the God's Promise Serving Bowl. This beautiful and versatile ceramic bowl is decorated with 2 Corinthians 9.8 and will make a lovely addition to your table or home. Finally, with your gift of $1,000 or more to help feed and care for 100 children, be sure to request our inspiring bronze sculpture, Consider the Birds, inspired by Jesus' words in Matthew 6.26. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. I want you to experience what we're experiencing today. I want you to feel my joy, to understand the gratitude I have in my heart for the fact that we can hand out these bowls of food because they're not bowls of food. They're bowls of life. We're here and we're able to fill these bowls on a daily basis as long as you continue to partner with us. As long as you do your part, we'll do ours and we'll make sure that these bowls get filled, that they get handed out, and that these tummies get filled and these lives get saved. So please continue to partner with us. Continue to bring joy, happiness, and life to child after child. You can see why it's so important for us to come together to make a difference in the lives of so many people. And when you do that today, with any gift that you're able to give to the ministry, we want to send you Lee's book, Is God Real? So when you make that call, just remember to request the book and we'll get it out to you right away. Lee, I have loved talking with you today. Oh, There's I've enjoyed so it. much more to cover. So you're going to come back tomorrow. We're going to talk about some topics that are important to me as well. Yeah. The suffering. Is God in the suffering of life? Where is he? Where can we find him? How can we trust that he's there walking that out with us? Yeah. If you're struggling with that or wrestling with that, like I have many times in my own journey, you're going to want to come back tomorrow. We're going to talk about that. We're grateful you're here today, but we'll see you tomorrow on Life Today. Bye-bye. Tomorrow, Lee Strobel tackles questions such as, if God is real, why is there so much suffering? If God is real, why does he seem so hidden? Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.